yourself in Vexing to play Scrapper with my father. There are many reasons for this. He has a huge memory with excellent recall. He's very, very good at manipulating symbols in his head. And the dictionary that we use when we get to the now play Scrapper and we're all in the same place is the Random House Dictionary of the English language. It was near the end of the game. We tried very, very hard to use as many of the magic squares as we can when we play Scrabble, so we had words all over the place. And one of the things about being at the end of the Scrabble game, it makes it difficult to put your tiles down. My mother's eyes light up because she can make a seven more word. There's some word that's descending. She can make it a plural. And she has on her tile work saltine. says to her, well, why don't you just make sailing? This thing, this presentation, is all about the sounds that we make when we talk to each other. Again, I apologize for the problem. Last year I gave a talk about storytelling, and in the question and answer session after that talk, I was asked a question which I completely dodged. And essentially, what that question was was, word choice. How do you choose the word that you use? This presentation is one part of one part of an answer to that question. All about the things that we can do with sound to say you're right. Now, I don't know how many people in here are bloggers or vloggers. I don't know how many people here write for what they do. This should easily be germane to everyone who has a blog, or, sorry, for everyone who has a podcast or a blog. I think it's also reasonable to think about it if what you do when you're on the is right for the page. And we believe that most of us learned language first through our ears, and then eventually later learned to read. And at least for me, it seems to be I tend to be. And there's a lot of noise coming in. And I do apologize for that. So it seems, it seems to me that if we've learned language through our ears first, some of that stuff sticks around. And I do know that when I read things that I've written, I'm happiest with the things that I've written, where they also sound good when you read them aloud. It is difficult, though, to pull those things apart. I'm here, I'm talking to you now, I'm making sounds. And you're listening to the sounds, and there are parts of your head that interpret those sounds and turn them into meaning. The parts of your head that are turning them into meaning, that are turning these sounds into English, are much stronger than the parts of your head that are just there to recognize which sound is which. And I'd like to demonstrate this a little bit by reading you something. Now, show of hands, please. Is anyone here familiar with Italian? Okay. Uh, Spanish? Portuguese? French? French? A little bit of French? Okay. So this is in Italian. Um, I am a little bit out of practice. I will try not to butcher it that much. What I'd like you to do is listen to the sounds that I make. Nel mezzo del cammino di nostra vita, mi ritrovai per una selva oscura. 
che la diritta via era smarita. A quanto a dir qua era e cosa dura, questa selva selvaggia ed aspra e forte, che nel pensier rinnova la paura. Tanto è amara che poco è più morte, ma per trattar per ben chi vi, vi, vi trovai, dirò delle altre cose che io vo scorte, e non so ben vedir come io vi entrai, tant'era pien di sono in su quel punto che la verace via abbandonare. Now, if I had to guess, most of them did not make any sense. But if I also had to guess, some of those words made you think you knew what they meant because you recognized them. And asking you to not recognize English is, I understand, a difficult proposition. But I'm going to be doing a little bit of that today. So I'm going to ask you to please bear with me. A large part of this is that we are pattern recognition machines. We like patterns. We like to recognize patterns. The best example of this I can give you is if you have a toddler in your life, or have access to a toddler, or anything like that. Or if you just simply want to watch some children's programs. Excellent example. The Teletubbies. Everyone I'm assuming in this room has some idea of what the Teletubbies are all about. If you watch the Teletubbies, because you, know, you are awake too late at night or in the middle of the day unemployed, or I'm not so sure when they show it these days, one thing you may notice is that it is very repetitious. It is the same images and sounds, the same story, over and over and over and over. There is a reason for this. It is children's programming, and it is children's programming targeted at a specific, you know, stage in the development of children, the stage where they really, really, really like to recognize things. It's part of who we are. It's part of what we do. We find patterns in, in our world, and we make sense of our world through those patterns. We've used this before. Um, this wasn't always a literate world. And I'm going to limit myself to Western culture here because I don't do that it's very complicated very, very quickly. But 600 years ago in Western Europe, the place where we come from, very few people could read or write. And what they did read or write was of a very limited scope. You read religious texts, that was it. And you knew what they meant, so you read them as an act of not learning so much, an act of remembrance an act of recall. So if you live in a world like that, if you live in a world where you can't write anything down, in order to remember things, in order to have a context for your daily life, you need to come up with some way to just stay on top of stuff. They have lots of ways of doing this. They used patterns. They used rhyming slam. They used verse. They use patterns in their, in, their, in their language so that they could remember they could remember the language for later. So some of those patterns, which are useful, some of them which they used, some of which we still use to this day. Rhyme. Rhyme is an excellent pattern is very, very strong. Let me give you an example. Is there anyone here named Amy? Okay. Yes. Basil? 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 Is there anyone here named? Okay. Clara? Is there anyone here named Clara? Desmond? Anybody? Okay, Amy, I apologize. Um, this is this is from Edward Gorey, the Gashley from Tinies. It is a piece of poetry about 26 young people, one for every letter, letter of the alphabet, and they all die in terrible, terrible ways. <laughs> a is for Amy, who fell down the stairs. B is for Basil, assaulted by bears. C is for Clara, who wasted away. D is for Desmond, thrown out of a sleigh. What I'd like to do is I'd like to read that again. I'd like to read that again, and this time, hopefully, we can bore the meaning-understanding part of your brain to the point where just the sound-understanding part of your brain 
listens to what's happening. The connections between the words. How we know that the line is over because we've heard the sound before. A is for Amy who fell down the stairs. B is for Basil assaulted by bears. C is for Clara who wasted away. D is for Desmond thrown out of the sleigh. A is for Amy who fell down the stairs. B is for Basil assaulted by bears. C is for Clara who wasted away. D is for Desmond now, this could rapidly get very annoying. Very annoying because you know it. You're starting to recognize the pattern. But this should give you an idea of the power of rhyme. Rhyme tells you when the line is over. Rhyme tells you when the next thing is starting. Along with rhyme is meter. The uh, pattern of stresses in a piece of language, in a piece of text. If I may. Sweet love, renew thy force, be it not said, thy edge should blunter be in appetite, which but today by feeding is alleged, tomorrow sharpened in his form of might. Now there is some rhyme there, but this is meter. This is Sonnet 56, Shakespeare. And meter is a little bit interesting, because meter is something that shows up in common interactions with people, far more than, say, rhyme does. But it's a little bit stealthy, because most of the time, when people think about meter, they are thinking about poetry, or song, lyrics, or they're thinking about stuff like this, Shakespeare, old things. Meter is still all around us. We're just not as attuned to it anymore, because it's not as important. Let me read it again. This time, listen for the rhythm. Sweet love, renew thy force. Be it not said, thy edge should blunter thee with an appetite, which but today by feeding is allay allayed. Oh, can you read my own? Tomorrow sharpened in his former mind. Apologies. One thing about this is because it is not used as much, it is subtle. We are all living in the middle of it can't really tell. So if you use meter to choose your words, to build your thoughts, when you break it, when you throw in something that doesn't fit, it is a very good way of calling attention to a thought or a moment in what you are doing. Calling attention to it in a way that people will notice, but not noticeably, because it's happening down there. You're not addressing them through the meaning of what you're saying, and that's what everybody's paying attention to. You're addressing them in the way that you're delivering it. We'll return to this. Another pattern, which is really kind of neat, and shows up a lot, particularly in marketing, commerce, advertising, alliteration. Using the same consonant, or some would say consonant or vowel, at the beginning of a word, followed by the same consonant at the beginning of the next word. You can have as many as you like. This is a poem called Susan Simpson. It is said to be by the author Anonymous. Uh, it's from a collection of Willard Espy, who collects these sorts of things. This is just a little bit. Sudden swallows softly skimming, sunset slowly spreading shade. The whole damn thing is written with words that start with S. This has an effect. You start to think, okay, what's the next word going to start with? S, something different. It builds a bit of tension. This happens a lot in advertising. Bed Bath & Beyond, Coca-Cola, PayPal, Bob Camp Pittsburgh. These are things that people remember. Alliteration is a good signpost. It allows you to put something in somebody's memory with ease. Assonance. It has an unfortunate name if you're in a junior high school. <laughs> Assonance is about the vowels. Internal rhyme. Putting sequences of vowels together in words, the same vowels together in words, one after another. 
from Edgar Allan Poe, from the bells. Hear the mellow wedding bells, golden bells. Something like having a fine time high in the sky, or the sea flows out slowly through the shoals, tugging the shore away. This one is interesting to me. This one is also my favorite. Because this one, you can use to manipulate mood. This is not one that people usually know about, and it's not one that people usually notice. Stringing vowels together like that, you can make something very bright, you can use a lot of eyes. You can make something very mellow, you can use a lot of O's. Edgar Allan Poe points out that um, the O is the most sonorous vowel, and the R is the most sonorous consonant. It's really a liquid. It's kind of half vowel, half consonant. But it is the reason why every po every stanza in the Raven ends with nevermore, O R. Those are the noises he chose. He chose on purpose. That's where he wanted. That's the sound he wanted at the end of every moment in that poem. He wrote an entire essay about this. It's worth reading. And then, this one we're going out on a little bit of a limb. So, this is not a rhetorical figure, and I've tried to do some research on this, a rhetorical figure that I've seen pop up before in any you know, rigorously studied way. But in thinking about it, in understanding my own speech patterns, in understanding the things that I like to say and the things that I like to here, patterns of vowels seem to be useful. And I think, I think I know why. Vowels happen when you make them in different parts of your mouth. So this is the part of the presentation where I ask you all to bear with me and maybe perhaps we can sit a little bit together. If I could ask everybody to say e, and hold it a little bit, e, okay, pretend, pretend that you're eating that e, and try to see where it is in your mouth. And if you can't really visualize it that much, I think it's about here. It's very forward. It's very up. So try it again. E, can you can you feel that? Does that make some sense? Um, let's do, let's do the opposite one. Oh, 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 all the way down, all the way back. And there's places where these vowels are, there's places where these vowels go. And you can make patterns in your speech by moving through these vowels. You say, well, here we are. Ah. noises. And there's things happening here. A, E, O. State. O, E, A. Response. A, A, E. Rejoinder. Question, perhaps. A, E, O. Completion. Completion, because we've seen the pattern before. So this is all I've got for the toolbox today. I've got these five little tools. I guess the first thing I should say about them is how I use them. In my experience, I have a lot of trouble using rhyme because it's bright, it's brassy, it's really, really strong. I find myself not being able to use it well, because it always makes my teeth grit a little bit when I use it. But it's very effective. You can get to people with it, and you can come up with things that people will remember. I don't use meter that much on purpose, because trying to use meter on purpose I find to be completely exhausting. It's not something that I'm good at. It's not something that I 
consciously do well. I was trying to come up with examples for this talk. That was difficult. Um, it seems I do use it. I'm told that I do, and I have evidence that I do, but it's not something that I handle well. It's not something that I handle well when generating text. But if you can use it, it's great. Because you can be very, very subtle. You can be subtle, and you can use this very, very subtle technique to encourage the reader or listener to believe that some things are more important than other things. I probably use alliteration too much because alliteration is fun. It's fun to use the same consonants over and over again. And it's fun to hear it, too. Um, it's possible to use it too much. There is a place where alliteration stops being fun and starts being cloying. I think a good place to explore that space is in the teleplays of Aaron Sorkin. He uses alliteration a lot. And he often uses it very, very well. But sometimes you notice. And when you start to notice these things, that may be it's too much when you turn to that. And I do find assonance to be my favorite. As I said, it is an excellent way to set me. And that's one of those things, again, which is completely subtle. even in just reading text that uses acid as well. I find that that goes a long, long way towards setting up what mood I should be feeling from something on a page or something over the radio or something on a podcast. As I said before, sometimes these things become noticeable. And that's where you want to be a little bit careful because if you start using these tricks, this toolbox, to the point where everybody's paying attention to the tricks that you're doing, and not so much to your message, that's counterproductive. The thing that you're trying to do is inform somebody of something, convince somebody of something, communicate something to someone. And the meaning is more important than the manner of the message. He said making the manner of the message much more important than the meaning. This talk is a little bit meta. But the real thing is, it comes down to a question of taste. You're going to have to understand what you like. You're going to have to figure out what you like doing, the things that you like to say, the things that you like to write. That's hard, because we're not tuned to pay attention to that stuff. We're tuned to pay attention to meaning, not method. So there's some things you can do. You can record yourself. You can have people listen to you and report back on what they liked. One thing you can try doing is you can record yourself and play it back at a very low volume at the far end of the room so that you have difficulty listening and hearing the actual meaning of the words and you can just listen to the sounds. Exposure is always good. Expose yourself to as much as you can of people who are good at this. And there are many people who are very, very good at this. Poets are very, very good at this. Read them aloud. Poetry is meant to be read aloud. Because a big part of poetry are the sounds you are making when you read the words. Listen to people who have excellent careers in radio. Chances are they're pretty good at this too. Listen to rap music. They've been at this for a while. There's this whole genre of people that are particularly interested in things like internal rhyme, end rhyme, alliteration. There's a lot. Acid. Quite a bit. They're all possible, and this happened to me. Take a course in linguistics, the linguistics of English, in English. You can watch the waves of understanding move through the classroom. And for all of these things, just see what you can make work. It's a big space. Try stuff. 
play with it. Find the things you like. And as often as possible, use the word salient. Because salient is fun to say. Thank you. I hope that was useful. Are there any questions? I used to be in IT. Um, at the moment, I'm kind of apprenticing myself to learn how to throw pots, like potters do. But I'm probably going back to IT at some point. So is this mostly from second nature, or do you have to plan it out? So this, so I am, I am not an expert on the psychology of this thing. I've read what I could, I've tried to understand as much as possible. Um, and there is, of course, tremendous amounts of, well, you know, experiment and, and, and studies. This is something that we're all trying, I think, very, very hard to understand scientifically. Um, but, Lord, I'm sorry, I lost the question. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Um, so, for, for things that are not real time, this is very difficult. Like, like trying to juggle, sitting here in front of you, and trying to juggle the notion of the kinds of things that I'm saying. Um, you know, the, the sounds that I'm making, plus the meaning that I'm trying to convey with the sounds that I'm making about the sounds that I'm making. That's really, really difficult. I'm not sure I did a very good job of it today. I do apologize for that. Um, but for everything else, it's just worth remembering that when you sit down to write something or when you sit down to record something, um, part of what you're doing is generating noises. And those noises have an effect. If, if you put these patterns into what you're saying, it's going to make a difference in how it's received. And this is part of why I can't give very good specific advice about this, because it is a very subtle part of a very complex interaction. This is just one little bit, one little bit of what goes into a podcast or a post. But it's not an important and if nothing else, it's worth thinking about a little bit. So if you can remember to think about it, like when you sit down to talk about something, you can say, okay, I'm going to talk about PodCamp Pittsburgh. Now there's alliteration right in the title. So if you if you are trying to choose words to talk about PodCamp Pittsburgh, you may want to see if you can come up with words that begin with the letter P, because those might resonate better with the subject at hand, or they might not. It might get very annoying very quickly. I don't know. But it would be worth thinking about when you're starting out. And it's always worth thinking about when you're editing. When you write something and you find that you've used the same word over and over and over and over and over again. Not, you know, a utility word, like a preposition or things like that. But you say that something is very pretty five or six times in a paragraph. For whatever reason. Because you look different parts of it at different times or this, that, or the other thing, but when you go back and read it, you see it. Pretty, 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 pretty. Because you picked up on the pattern. And that's not a pattern you want. You want other patterns. And that's the sort of thing that you can add. Is that is that helpful? Does that to help answer the question? That's right. Okay. The, uh Oh, oh, you did, you thought a little bit in advance, uh, but, but not to be doing it more spontaneously. Doing it spontaneously is just being aware. Um, I don't know how, I, I don't, well, so let me say this. I don't know if I'm any good at this, and I don't know, if I am any good at this, I don't know how I got that way, other than reading a lot, listening to people talk a lot, um, 
saying to myself, look, here's a game. A game you can play is whenever you say something that is fun to say, say. That's fun to say. It's fun to say salient. I enjoy saying salient. Salient's a fun word. It's, it's unctuous. It's slippery. It's got a pattern of value. It's got a pattern, a pattern of, of vowels that appeal to me. And just simply recognizing that in your vocabulary, in your daily words, uh, goes a long way to tuning your appreciation of how that works. And again, this is a personal thing. This is stuff that you like. Yeah, that's cool. It was brilliant in the slidey toes. And also, Alice's I forget exactly what was her comments afterwards. She sort of wasn't sure if she knew what. I forget what it was. How many about to the answer? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I am not. I am not in a position where I can make words up. <laughs> I am nowhere near that level. Um, but just adding, understanding the sounds that words are adds a whole other dimension to the ways that you can use them. And I think that's what's saying. This was very short. I'm sorry. I think I went a little bit faster than I expected to. It was very interesting. I enjoyed it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Reminds me of a Seinfeld episode. So number one condiment, condiment is salsa. salsa. People, people like, like to say salsa. salsa. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Okay.